you may have seen my video about the 10 best manufacturers. If you haven't, check out the card above or the link below. I got a lot of requests for the 10 worst manufacturers, and that's a lot harder to nail down. But I got to thinking about it, and I came up with five deserving for a list like this. So let's jump right into it. Here are the world's worst coaster manufacturers. Let's get some of the others out of the way first. People may think of these as the worst, but I have a different view. How about Gio Vanola? They did a lot of subcontractor work for Intamin, and they only made a few coasters themselves. But they were all major rides. Anaconda at Gold Reef City was their first, very similar to a Batman the Ride clone. And then they broke the height record with Goliath, and then basically cloned that with Titan. I think these are really weak hypers, but does this make them one of the worst? No, these are smooth and fast, and if you love intensity and hate airtime, maybe you like these coasters. Vacombo would probably make this list if I made it 10 years ago, but they've redeemed themselves big time. Two others that always get brought up are the Italian manufacturer Pinfari and the Russian manufacturer Pax. These are not great coasters, but they serve a purpose. If you're a tiny park or a county fair and you need a large scale portable coaster, these are your guys. I'd rather these parks have a janky 60 foot coaster than no coaster at all. They're not trying to be great, just filling a gap in the coaster world. My one honorable mention is Hopkins. This Florida-based company hasn't come out with anything new since 1996, so that could explain a lot. I've only ridden one of their coasters, Texas Tornado at Wonderland, and this is one weird looking coaster. Why do those loops look like that? I'm assuming they built it, it didn't work, and they had to tweak it. So we get this hilarious thing. Texas Tornado is a weird janky ride, but not terrible. I've never ridden Desert Storm in Arizona, and I never got to ride Dragon at Adventureland, though I hear that was bad. They also have a coaster that's been idle for 11 years now. Cliffhanger at Ghost Town Village in North Carolina. This is another large scale looper that I've heard very little about. So if you've ridden this, let me know how it was in the comments below. With only one Hopkins coaster on my list, I can't put them on this list, but they're on the edge of it. Number five, the Din Corporation. Charles Din is best known for his work on the Beast when he worked for Kings Island. But for 10 years, his own company developed 10 coasters across America. All of their work came between 1988 and 1991. So it's hard to judge them too harshly in 2021, especially when it comes to roughness. A lot of that has to do with maintenance, but where other manufacturers with much older coasters, like PTC, seem to still be running great, the DIN coasters seem to take a turn for the worse quickly. Wolverine Wildcat, Timberwolf, Cyclone, Mean Streak, and most of all, Predator make up some of the roughest wooden coasters on my list. I heard that Hercules at Dorney Park was brutally rough, and Texas Giant wasn't so pleasant before being RMC'd in 2011. The one that I can point to and say, that one runs pretty great, is Thunder Run at Kentucky Kingdom. But this falls into another problem with thin coasters. The layouts aren't that good. The second half of Thunder Run is a snooze fest. Mean Street just meandered around while shaking you up. Wolverine Wildcat and Timberwolf aren't that bad. Those are two of just four din coasters left. All of these are over 30 years old now, so which one will be the last din standing? We'll have to see. All of these operate at smaller chain parks, so they may stick with them for a while. Number four, Zamperla. This Italian manufacturer makes some really great flat rides, and you'll find these everywhere big parks and small parks, but their coasters leave a lot to be desired. There's 362 operating all around the world, which is amazing. They thrive on their smaller coasters, and that makes up most of their collection. They have also flooded the world with their spinning wild mouse coasters, mixing in their launch motorbike coasters. This is kind of their middle tier family style rides. At the very top of their collection, they released a couple of extreme models that didn't quite work out. One of them is the Volaire model. This is a very crude attempt at a flying coaster, lying face down in cages and twisting you around in a compact layout. If you can find one without pads around your ears, it's not that bad. But if you ride one and you look around and you see your head is surrounded, you're in for the worst coaster experience of your life. Soren Eagle at Luna Park leaves your head clear and free, so you will survive even if you don't have that much fun. But when it comes to Time Warp at Canada's Wonderland or Superflight at Rye Playland, you won't be so lucky. North Korea's biggest coaster is a Volair, though I'm not clear if this is supposed to be a thrill ride or the place where Kim Jong-un sends his enemies. The other extreme model is a little better. This is the Thunderbolt model. Depending where you sit, it could be one of the worst coasters of your life, or it could be all right. My first ride in a back edge seat was grotesque. My second ride in a front middle seat was okay. Either way, this felt very janky, and it wasn't great, even though it has a vertical drop, inversions, and airtime hills. If you want a good sense of Zamperla's collection, check out Luna Park on Coney Island. They operate this place, and they loaded it with their own coasters. So just go there and take in all that Zamperla. Number three, Togo. I understand this Japanese manufacturer builds decent rides in Japan, but they never got anything right in America. 
Bandit and Fujiyama look like really good rides. But what the heck were they thinking with their American collection? Their American office closed in 2001, right around the time that Knott's Berry Farm was suing them for the Windjammer debacle. This dual-track looping mouse was barely operational. It shut down in a slight breeze. It rarely ever had both sides running, and it ran rough with a boring layout. It lasted three long years. Their stand-up coasters may have been good at the time when they opened in the 80s, but they became incredibly outdated, and the last one was taken out of North America in 2015. Their best coaster was probably Ultra Twister, operating at Great Adventure and Astro World. I actually really wish I could have ridden this. Great Adventure also had to put up with Viper, somehow lasting 10 seasons before the park finally gave mercy to its guests and removed it in 2004. It was replaced by a ride on the other end of the spectrum, the world-class El Toro. The one Togo that still stands in America is the Big Apple Coaster in Vegas, and this one isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It just got new trains, and maybe that'll help with some of the head and neck pain, but it doesn't do anything about the horrible transitions and the dumb layout. Maybe Togo is playing a big prank on America with this collection. I don't see how they can build good coasters in Japan that people actually want to ride, and this is what they ended up with in America. It really makes me wonder what it would be like if Togo landed any of the hypercoaster projects in the early 90s. How would that have changed things? What would the world look like if Magnum, Desperado, or Steel Phantom were made by Togo? Maybe if they were built, and they were good, we would see a lot more Togo projects still going strong today, and Togo would have never closed their offices. It hurts my head to think about. Number 2. Skyline This is a little like Gio Vanola since they only have a couple coasters, but unlike those boring hypers that some people like, I don't think anyone's that crazy about Skyline. The concept of their compact, repetitive looping coasters seem interesting, kind of like a Larson Loop 2.0. And maybe small parks would load up on these, just like they did with the Larson Loops. Six Flags jumped at the chance to get the first one, the vertical sky warp called Harley Quinn Crazy Coaster. Despite the simple nature of the ride, it took forever to get open, finally making its debut in August of 2018. It's one of the roughest and most uncomfortable and boring coasters I've ever ridden, and I'm shocked I was able to ride it. It hardly ever seemed to be open. This closed down in 2021, and it's gotta be considered a massive fail for Six Flags. SeaWorld San Diego opened the horizontal version of the Sky Warp one year later, Tidal Twister. This is a little better, but still uncomfortable. It's basically an inline twist in an airtimeless airtime hill, over and over again. This is still going strong at the park, so we'll see if SeaWorld sticks with it. Skyline is coming out with more ideas, and they basically look the same, just with a slightly different inversion. Their most interesting concept is probably their family Biscetti coaster, an intertwined, single-rail, small-scale coaster, and this looks like a really good option for kids. My only hope is that they can do something about the roughness of their originals. I don't know how Harley Quinn ran so rough with that single rail, but if they can shore that up, they can make a rebound. One other thing, Skyline Design is listed as a designer for some of GCI's wooden coasters. They're a subsidiary of Skyline Attractions, and I had no idea they did this. Invader, Wicker Man, Mystic Timbers, and others. Good on Skyline for their work on these rides, even if they aren't the listed manufacturer. Number one, the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, or RCCA. There can only be one manufacturer at the top of this list. It's got to be RCCA. Their first project came in 1992 with the Rattler at Fiesta, Texas. An interesting idea to build a wooden coaster on the side of a quarry wall, but what an atrocious layout. This also looks like it got rough real fast, not to mention the small shallow drops and the endless helix on top of the quarry wall. They went on to build Montezum in Brazil in 1999, along with Bandit at Movie Park Germany. And at least Bandit has the reputation of being one of the worst wooden coasters ever built. Magnus Colossus at Spain's Terra Medica is another coaster built into a hillside, but it was built to look good first and foremost, and the ride experience was the last priority. It was slow and rough and hasn't operated since 2016. Another Spanish coaster, Coaster Express, is considered by some to be the worst wooden coaster in the world. With 4,500 feet of track, including two massive helices, I imagine it feels like it never ends. It's getting track work, so when it reopens, maybe it won't be so dreadful. But you can't talk about RCCA without bringing up Son of Beast. Paramount tasked them with building the world's tallest wooden coaster, and one of the longest. Oh, and it also had a vertical loop. They designed a visually amazing coaster that had a boring layout, and they cut corners, which caused severe issues throughout the ride's short life. RCCA was sued by Paramount before the ride was even six months old. The company went out of business in 2005, so nobody will be tempted to order anything from them ever again. We're all better off for it. So there's my list of worst manufacturers. Let me know what you think, and if there's anyone else that you would add onto here. Maybe you even like one of these on my list, especially Zamperla. And just a reminder, I'm only counting their coasters on this list, not their flat rides. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like. That's the best way to show your support for the channel. And if you're new here and love coasters, be sure to sub for more content just like this, including my top 10 best manufacturers. That'll be linked below. Also check out my Discord server, where you can chat with other fans of the channel, and my second channel, where I post copyright-free off-ride footage. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.